Right, Maria Lopiano here, and today my guest is Nicholas Pinnock. Thank you so much for joining me this Wednesday morning, Nicholas. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Now, Nicholas has been on stage and TV for some time now. You're an actor with a very varied CV. People would recognise your name and face from the likes of Channel 4's hit four-part series Top Boy, where you played Leon, or as the very suave and handsome Jason Backland in Marcella. You crossed over the pond and you are the protagonist of an ABC legal drama series called For Life. Tell us a bit about that. What's that all about? So For Life is um, loosely inspired by the uh, true life events of an amazing gentleman called Isaac Wright Jr., who was falsely incarcerated um, on the kingpin charge for dealing drugs in the state of New Jersey and given life. While inside, he became paralegal um, and prison rep and managed to get 20 of his fellow inmates off for their cases wow. and exonerated. Then managed to create new case law in one of his cases that he added to his own kingpin case, got himself off and exonerated from one charge, but then he still had um, uh, 73 years of his sentence on another charge that they pinned on him. He then managed to get himself to trial a second time and got himself off of that, became exonerated. And then seven years after, seven or nine years after leaving, no, he, he spent seven years in jail. Nine years after leaving prison, he was able to take his bar and um, wow. he passed. And he is now uh, a lawyer working in the state of New Jersey. And he incredible? did what, oh yeah, he was not one in a million. He was one because nobody has done that previously. Yeah. He's amazing. So the story is, is you know, inspired by um, his life and time in jail. And the thing is, it's not just, you know, it's incredible he got him himself off and he was sort of studying, obviously, in prison. But the fact that 20 of his inmates were well i guess innocent and inside and that's yeah. just one prison so so it's a bit like well around the country how many innocent people are locked up yeah you know? so that, that was 20 20 of his fellow inmates um and so highlights the injustice and yeah. um, racial bias of the uh the system of the legal system. Well, although Isaac will tell you that the legal, the judicial system in America is probably the best in the world, but it's the people that have corrupted it right, and made yeah. it so that minorities and the poor are therefore overcharged on charges that white people would normally get and given longer sentences. And then they're offered wow. plea deals and they know that they can't, you know, if you're off, if you're given a 20 year um, prison sentence, yeah. And your plea deal with the um, opposing counsel is 12 years. You're probably going to, instead of going, could, yeah. instead of fighting your innocence and staying for 20 years, you're going to go, okay, I'll do 12, even though you're innocent. Yeah. yeah because yeah, you yeah. don't have enough money to get a lawyer to fight the case to get you off knowing that you're innocent. Yeah. And he says that happens all the time, but it's big business in America. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, exponentially done to people of minority backgrounds more often than not black people yeah yeah well because which is very like timely said, in the uh absolutely. wake of everything that's going uh, on at uh, the moment the reviews are incredible you must be incredibly proud i mean not least that you're a british actor playing an american in america which only adds to the pressure of doing the role justice i mean what was that like like the first day on set were you terrified <laughs> Um, I'm nervous every single time I get on set and every single time I get on stage. Um, but it was, yeah, no, it, it, is, it is incredible. I was, um, you know, luckily for the, for the first episode, the pilot episode was directed by a, a wonderful director called George Tillman, who um, directed a really, really beautiful socially conscious movie called The Hate You Give. Right. Um, and he and I and the showrunner, Hank Steinberg, we spent a lot of time cultivating what we wanted Aaron to be like, who we wanted to be. So I took some ideas about, you know, what I wanted my voice 
to sound like right. and my physicality and um you know how these things would work and why i thought they would work and you know we we shaped them and refined them and made them something that we wanted to see in our um our lead actor yeah well because lead character it. sorry i mean like you say it's it's based around isaac right but you weren't playing him i mean you were not an imitation of isaac you, no. you developed the character aaron you know yourselves yeah, I mean, because it was, it was, it would have been easy to have done a, a like for like and, yeah. and be, be Isaac, but because of li- something called life rights, which they would need to have done for every single person that he came into contact with to allow their story to be told as well, it would have been very oh. timely and very costly, which is How why it's not based on, yeah. yeah, which is why it's not based on this life of Isaac Wright, but inspired by. The life okay. of Isaac, right? So one story of his, we were able to tease out and probably make two episodes out of. Yeah. Um, but the core of it is this core story and the thread of it is still the same. A man who is wrongly imprisoned. Yeah, sure. Because of racial bias and um, he fights to get himself and, yeah. out. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so but it, I was nervous first day. Yeah, very, very nervous. I and. Bet. um it was um it was a big task it was my biggest role to date and, and i think actually, you know you on set sorry so on set yeah, did on. you sort of the minute you uh put foot on set yeah did you have uh aaron's accent like for instance i've known you for a long time and i remember very early on <laughs> you telling me that you would call up people like takeouts or friends hotel bookings and speak in an american accent which was hilarious oh, yeah. just to see yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just so you could keep practice this american I did. Accent. it was it was something i would do back and I, I remember back in the early <laughs> 2000s in the late 90s i would um just i would find an area code plus zero zero one area code and then just randomly dial numbers and i would and depend and you know whoever picked up the phone i would just start talking in an american accent and pretending to look for you know is bobby there please you know and i just ask for bobby and they go we don't know who bobby is who's ba- so um, good um, hey donald have you heard of a bobby there's a man on the phone asking for bobby um, no i'm sorry who when did he live here maybe he lived here before we did and maybe and you know we'd have this whole conversation that is um, and sometimes I would go, um, I'd break out of accent and I'd go, listen, I'm really sorry. I just, I'm sorry to have wasted your time, but I'm, I don't know who Bobby, I don't know who Bobby is either, but I'm an actor from the UK and I'm trying to perfect my American accent. And That's I just so wanted good. to see if I could get away with it. And they'd go, oh, you're an actor. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> Donald, we got an actor on the phone from England. He was just practicing. Stop and it. you know. We'd have these the old people were the, the best, the elderly were the best because they would just like to talk. Yeah, I bet. And, They're like, um, who's this? <laughs> yeah. And it was, it, no, it was great. It was really, um, <laughs> and I'd call up friends who I knew out there and pretend not to be me um, oh. and then say, no, 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 sorry, no, it's, it's Nicholas, it's Nicholas. And, and so go, we're going back. So on set, did you only speak in Aaron's accent or did you flip and they were like, whoa, 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 whoa what's going on? <laughs> no. So when I'm, whenever I'm playing um, in a different accent, what I do is I, um, I actually start, um, I start the prep beforehand. So a week or two before I was in, um, I was in New York and I would walk around with an American accent, pretending yeah. I was American. And, yeah, and I mean, you know, just walking around like, a, you know, like an American. Yeah. And I would Brilliant. get the accent before I get on set. Because the trick is, if, if I just learned my lines in the American accent, whenever they would change the script, in my head, I'd go, well, that would be quite difficult because I would yeah. then have to try and, you know, perfect that one or two words they've moved or, um, you know, it wouldn't give me space to paraphrase or ad lib if I wanted to. And I wanted to be as authentic as possible. So I hung out in um, in Manhattan and in Brooklyn and, you know, up near the Bronx and just um, listened to people and tried to copy them. Yeah. And I mean, I've played American before, but whenever I play American, I will stay in accent the whole time until the very last day of the job. I will break accent. Yeah. And I had a lot of the crew um, at the end of the gig that didn't know that I was uh, I was British hilarious and then yeah. at the end of it all <laughs> yeah i uh, i was freaking them out 
And some of them would say to me, you know, halfway through, I, you know, I saw you an interview. I, are you British? Are you? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, can, can, can we hear it? And I'd be like, no, no, no. no. I said, but keep, keep it quiet though. I, I'm, I'm, because I don't want everyone to know. They're like, oh, okay. So they were in, they were in on my secrets. Oh, they loved it. Funny. They absolutely loved it. I mean, um, I've watched some interviews with you and Curtis 50 Cent Jackson, who is a yeah. producer of the show and plays a part in the show. And there is yeah. a lot of love there. He clearly thinks the world of you and it's really sweet to watch. Did you guys know each other before this series? No, we didn't. I obviously knew who he was and, yeah. you know, he had a vague idea who I was because he was, you know, the exec producer and uh, the one that had to sign off employing me. So he had watched Top Boy, which is right. a bit of a hit in America and um, a few other things. Um, so no, he knew, um, so he knew about me from, um, from Top Boy um, and a few other things. And so we kind of, you know, we had an idea of who each other was. I mean, I knew who he was. He's famous on five continents. Yeah, oh, um, absolutely. And he had, he had a vague idea of who I was. Um, but we, you know, it's funny. People asked me this before, you know, what was he like? And did you know each other? And, and I said, actually, I, I don't know what 50 Cent is like. I know what Curtis Jackson is yeah. like because I didn't meet 50 Cent. 50 Cent is his rapping persona. Yeah. 50 Cent is his alter ego. He's, you know, he's the the internationally, you know, world renowned, famous, yeah, yeah. record breaking, you know, one of the best selling rap artists in the whole world. Um, but when he comes on set, he's Curtis because he, when he comes on set to act, he's Curtis Jackson yeah. and he is, you know, acting's not his, his day job. Music is his day job, producing is his day job. And he comes and he's there and he's humble and he's willing and he's, eager to learn and we run lines together and yeah I mean yeah, it's, and you um, see that it's in hard his not to because he's in the sort of in the in the role you can kind of see his vulnerability and yeah he seems like a lovely man oh he really is and I think you know and I've said it and I will continue saying it, this is the best acting yeah. I think he's delivered in um in anything that he's done previously but you know he doesn't come on set with an entourage he comes with one guy who, you know, yeah. is his friend for 25 years. Um, uh, nice. You know, there's no hierarchy. There's no bravado. Yeah, He's yeah, just a regular actor yeah. on set. No, not at all. And, you know, he knows it's essentially my show. He doesn't step on that at all he's very very giving and warm and humble he, but he does, he's got nothing to prove yeah. he's already made yeah. his name he's already famous and it were, if were it not for him none of us would be there so he doesn't have that he doesn't have anything to prove and he's extremely humble when he comes on set as a producer sometimes we see 50 cent and he is extremely charismatic and he's extremely charming and you know all the other things but you know i got to know and the person that i you know speak to every now and then and is Curtis yeah, Jackson. Lovely. He's a, an amazing, amazing man. I've got a lot of time and a lot of respect oh, for him. Now, I guess being a legal drama, uh, so looking at past dramas, I mean, even the old school LA law and the good wife suits, mm -hmm. uh, legal dramas have legs because, of course, every episode you can get a new interesting story that can take you wherever. Are there plans for another uh -huh. series? Not. Well, let me correct well, one thing. This is what everyone thinks until they get I'm to only, episode five. Right. Oh, well, I'm on episode four. <laughs> ah. So this isn't just a legal drama. It's a legal drama, it's a family drama, and it's a prison drama. Yeah. And where it's not procedural either, where you have exactly what you mentioned. You know, every week there's a different story, and you just keep going and going and going. And that's the same format every single week. This is not that. The, what's, the diff, what's different to... Our drama on, on the legal side compared to most legal dramas is every case or most cases that Aaron is looking for to represent as prison rep through the prisoners yeah. that he's representing are all cases that will help his case. So he's very self-motivated. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, he's got by episode he's, five, yeah. He, yeah, he's got a clear vision as to what mm -hmm. he wants to achieve. It's not just... I'm going to be the friendly, selfless lawyer and help all these people get off their charges. Yeah, yeah. No, he's actually being very, very selfish and he will do, you know, he's morally, Smart. he's conflicted. Um, and he's not all, you know, sunshine and flowers either because he's, he's got an agenda. And that agenda is to get himself off of his, um, get himself to trial to exonerate himself. Yeah. 
Um, but what happens after episode five is we see the drama shift and morph into something that's not procedural. Um, and so uh, following the life of Isaac Wright, Isaac does actually get out of jail. So at some point throughout the seasons, depending on how many we're gifted in being able to, um, to deliver, he will get out of jail and then there will be another story right. that ties him to, to prison uh, because he's now, he's then a lawyer out in the world. Yeah. Because after Isaac got out, there's a whole lot of other things. Well, actually, that, that yeah, happened. you mentioned sort of early on that it was another sort of I don't know seven years before he was allowed to practice law. Yes, it was, and that's where and that's where um, Aaron's the character that I play. That's where Aaron's story is different to Isaac's. Aaron is actually a practicing lawyer, right. um, in prison, who has taken the bar and is okay. you know and can represent yeah, yeah. people. Isaac wasn't until he got out of jail. So we've kind of, yeah. you know, we've, we've bent the truth again, only being inspired by Isaac's story. We were able to, you know, yeah. do certain things for dramatic purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we still have a, um, an idea for a storyline once he leaves jail. Brilliant. Whenever that may yeah. be. Now, people are always surprised by how long a film or a series is shot, you know, they're watching a 45 minute hour episode and they imagine that it takes, you know, the actor a day to shoot, <laughs> which of course is very different to reality. Now, uh, I've seen you oh, mention yeah. that with this for life, you would take what, eight days for an episode? How does that eight differ for, for Marcella, something like here and Marcella? Um, is it a similar sort of time frame? Or are they very different? Well, the main the main main difference of working here and in America is, um, you know, the days and the amount of crew on set. Eight days to do an episode is ridiculously quick. Yeah. Um, especially a drama of that magnitude, um, because it's it's essentially three dramas. You've got three plot lines. You've got the prison drama, the um, legal drama, and the family yeah, drama. Yeah. And there's a lot of content, a lot of actors, and to cram all of that in eight days is is a lot. It's a, it's a drama. It's not just a sitcom. It's not half hour. It's you know meant to be slot between you know an hour. So it runs at about forty six minutes with five ad breaks. Um, in the UK, a drama of that magnitude, you would have anywhere between the minimum being eleven days and the maximum being about fifteen wow. for one episode. Um, and so the yeah, turnover yeah. rate is is so high and it was again it's the first time i've done that i'd never done that before so it was um absolutely new territory for me and the crew size in america is you know you've got up to 70 maybe 80 crew members on set at any one time wow. in the uk you've got half that if not less now nicholas looking at black lives matter the movement happening now for life couldn't have been timed better it's strong solid story and one that you'd hope everyone now understands and really kind of gets behind um again i recall you in your younger days turning down roles that were negative black roles and you were a struggling actor then so that took some guts nicholas and i remember being really proud of you for standing by your principles and saying no i'm not doing it are you quite aware of kind of being I don't know a bit of a role model or have a sense of responsibility I, I don't see it that way I was just basically doing what I felt was right for yeah. me and hoping that it would permeate to being right for other people because so I had um I had uh I, w I was always the type of actor that said no to roles that I didn't want because Acting is the thing I love probably the most in the world. Um, don't tell my sister that. Um, <laughs> and, and um, you know, it means a lot to me. So I, my, my thing was I would always only ever do things that I really wanted to do. After, you know, my apprenticeship years, when I first went out there as, a, as an adult yeah. actor after being a child actor for so many years, um, you know, I kind of did, you know, the Bill and EastEnders and... Uh, yeah. doctors and Holby City and casualty just to you know get my feet get some things on my CV and then pretty yeah, quickly course. I was very much um, okay no I don't want to do that anymore because if you're going to make me a drug dealer make it a drug dealer that's got three dimensions to it and is in more than one episode yeah, yeah. and I was very clear about what I wanted my career path to be but you have to go back and remember that I knew 
what I wanted to do from the age of four. Yes. And so nothing was really going to steer me off my path. So I was very clear as to what I wanted and how I was going to get it. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I found myself in, a, in a, a bit of a wilderness, what I call my wilderness years, where I wasn't really working much. And so I suffered a mental breakdown 14 years ago. And um, that led me into therapy, which then led me not to work as much, which then led me to credit card debts and working in a hotel and negating all my mortgage for three months. So I was £30,000 in debt. I had um, someone living in my spare room. I was working at a hotel doing eight hour shifts, sometimes 16 hour shifts with a half hour break um, at £5.80 an hour. I was also working two jobs as a um, acting and dialect coach at two colleges performing arts colleges outside of London. I was three months behind in my mortgage payments and wow. I was just about making the minimum payments for my credit card bills. But I was still saying no, because I knew, well, I, I knew what I wanted my career path to be. Yeah. And I wasn't gonna steer from that path because up and, you know, it's always worked for me. So I, 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 did, I had a plan A, I didn't have a plan B. Yeah. And whenever well, plan A, a wasn't working, I just retweaked plan A and kept it at plan A and didn't have a plan B. Yeah, I have heard um, it said before, uh, uh, for performers, don't have a plan B because otherwise you will fall onto plan B. <laughs> right. So do you remember at school when we were doing our GCSEs? There was a teacher, the history teacher, I can't remember who it was. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen, right. <laughs> so it's Mr. Cohen, or, oh no, or is it the maths teacher, Mr. Ronan? Mr. Ronan, yeah. Right, so it was Mr. Ronan, and he basically, I remember he said something very, very poignant that um, always stuck with me. He said, this industry is really, really difficult. Most of you in this room are not going to make it. Um, so I'm going to make sure to give you a start in life so you have something to fall back on. Basically, he was allowing us to cheat. <laughs> it was like someone took a baseball bat and hit me in the head and I thought, hold on, if I have something to fall back on, I'm probably gonna end up falling back on it. Yeah. And at that point, I decided to deliberately um, fail my GCSEs. So I left Stop school, it. yeah, I left school with no qualifications on paper that could get me a job deliberately and then i followed you and four other um uh students that we were at school with yeah. to to dance college because i didn't know what else i was going to do yeah i didn't know what i didn't know what else we were going to do and it was you that actually said why don't you come to studio center and i went yeah okay that's what i'm gonna well, do also at that time nicholas we were 16 when we went there and right. even at that time there weren't many colleges that took you on at 16 you had to be 18. A i studio was 15 Center days was one I was of the 15 few days a 16 year old yeah <laughs> i was the youngest boy at the time i was the youngest ever boy that had um, attended that school yeah oh, yeah it is mad. and so i so i basically gave myself no option but to make it work so when I got to a point where I was on my feet, where I was, you know, uh, flat on my ass and, you know, not being able to stand on my feet, I had to keep saying no because, you know, a lot of soap operas were offering me contracts and offering me auditions. And I just kept saying, nope, 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 yeah, nope, yeah. nope. And then a script landed on my door. And I kept reading, I read it and they wanted me for one role, but then there was this other role that just kept speaking to me. I kept reading it, kept reading it. And this other role just kept coming at me and, you know, going, oh, actually, I really want to play that role. So I spoke to my agent and I said to them, look, can you speak to the casting director and ask them if I can go up for this role? And they said, well, we spoke to the casting director. We've asked them if you can go up for the role. Um, it's reserved for a, a big TV actor. So no, but you can audition for it anyway. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll audition for this other one and I'll audition for that one. Because it yeah. was a good script and I wanted to be a part of the story. And the role that they offered me wasn't bad. It just wasn't as good as this other one. Yeah. It didn't speak to me. Um, got to the audition. The casting director said to me, uh, so you didn't like the role that we put you up for? And I said, well, it's not that. He says, I just think I'm better suited for this other role. He said, okay, yeah, you ready to cast? I said, yeah, okay, which one do you want me to do first? He said, forget the one that, that, you, uh, that we put you up for. Do the one you want to do. Let me see what you got. 
Yeah. Um, and I got the job that day, and that was Top Boy, and that <gasps> turned everything around. How everything. brilliant! Wow. So you, so you know, seeing Top Boy, you weren't up for that role. How? No, no. Mm. So Isn't here's the thing: brilliant. had I had I not had I not stuck to my plan and known my own mind, I probably wouldn't be talking to you yeah. under these circumstances right now. That's it. It just takes one role or great even I remember you telling me once it could be uh you could do a terrific job in something that is uh an epic fail and no one's gonna want you even though your part in it may be really good and the other way around you could be absolutely rubbish but it's (laughs) it's in something that's really good um but it just so happens you know you were both but that's it top boy was a massive success and I suppose opened up you know, oh, it was it, it, def- it was a it was another defining moment in my career because it, it made it because it became a hit. And it was so wild, well received, and so widely. Mm. Um, people, casting directors that had known me from being a kid, because they hadn't seen me on TV for, I just thought I'd given up acting um, because I just kept saying no. I just kept saying no. Um, Amazing. Now you mentioned about sort of having a mental breakdown. You're an ambassador yes. now for mental health charity Mind UK. You've been yes. very open about mental health and your own suffering. Now you gave a wonderful talk on your social media about mental health and lockdown, about people being forced to spend time with themselves and the difficulties mm-hmm. that ma- that may bring up. Um, just tell us a bit about about that. I mean, and how you know you're finding it, friends finding it. I thought it was a really sort of interesting piece. Yeah, well, I had a lot of um, conversations with friends and family who were struggling um, because they weren't seeing friends, they weren't seeing other family members, and Mm. they were missing going out and, you know, going to restaurants, and their life has changed and all this sorts of stuff. And what what became clear to me were people who had relied on the distractions of life, be it work, play, and anything else, to stop them from listening to their inner voice and being uncomfortable with just sitting with self. Mm. And that just kept coming up in people's stories. It just kept coming up, kept coming up. And um, that's why I spoke about it in that uh, in that post, because it just became very clear to me. Had I not done the work that I had to have done in psychotherapy for two and a half years yeah. when I had my breakdown, and then taking an extra four years after that to work out how to use the tools that I learned in therapy to manage my life. And then a further four years after that to actually put it into practice. Yeah, it's a long process. I probably would have been feeling the same thing. So when lockdown came and work stopped, going out stopped, going to the theater stopped, going to cinema, seeing my friends, going to restaurants, yeah, yeah. seeing family members, and we were just stuck in the house. I was actually really okay because I'm used to, I was, you know, used to a pattern of, sitting with myself and analyzing what was going on and how do I really feel? Yeah. What, what, what is this uncomfortable feeling? And I would always investigate what that was about. So for me, it was, um, you know, an absolute win-win. I managed to get some time after my grueling schedule of filming to just sit but, with myself and, you know, feel, be okay with yeah. the uncomfortableness of it because, you know, I'm never in one place for very long. I travel, travel a lot and, I'm always out and I'm doing things and I'm always yeah. working. I'm always busy, 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 busy. Yeah. Um, and physical well-being is also, you know, Oh, totally. Key. They work uh, hand in hand. Yeah. And how are, you, so how are you dealing with that? Are you Obviously, there's no gym. Do you do outdoor training? Have you started anything new? I've started yoga. I'm loving that. I started <laughs> yoga and Pilates, yeah. You? <laughs> yeah, I did. I it's started good, yoga and Pilates, it? started stretching again, and it was fantastic because – I gave up going to the gym about two years ago and, and right. uh, so just started working keep? on... Because you look amazing. Thank you. Body weight. Just push-ups, pull-ups, right. sit-ups, squats. Um, just nothing heavier than my own body weight. Yeah. And my body responded to it better than going to the gym ever did. And it took me a long time to, to um, get there. I think when I was younger, you know, going to the gym was, was beneficial for me, but... Um, as I'd gotten older and got into a plateau of strength, yeah. my body wasn't reacting to the exercises as, as well. So when I gave up going to the gym, my, what happened was something that was twofold and far better for me personally was my body reacted better. And I got in touch with the body-mind connection a lot stronger yeah. because I was 
basically just connected to my body and not externally pushing heavier weights. Well, it's literally I'm finding just me that with, doing dealing with me. Yeah, I'm finding that with yoga. And I, I was like, wow, this should run. And I think a lot of colleges do now, hand in hand with dance, because it does connect. I don't know. There, when you it dance, really it's kind of just about dancing and you feel the music and you sort of throw yourself in, the, in these positions. Yeah. And then yoga, it's more reflective and the focus and the breathing i'm like wow I, I've, yeah. you know, i'm yeah i'm hooked i have to say and not people not many people know this but you were, you were quite a dancer you trained we trained together we have you train ever together. done I mean, last time i saw you dance you might have been 20 years old which is quite some time ago <laughs> Nicholas Pinnock. um have you ever danced again um, like in the last sort of so i was know, with or... a contemporary dance company and i left them about 25 years ago <laughs> Uh, the Fanshawes. I left them 25 years ago. And um, as a model, you know, in my younger days as well, yeah. we, I, and I would dance on the circuit and things like that, and that was fine. But then I gave up when I was 30. Oh, the, last okay. weekend, I, <laughs> last weekend. So I say I, last weekend you were 30. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't want to go back to being 30. Um, but last weekend I um, recorded a dance performance that I had done 25 years ago with the Fanshawes for um, a quarantine Elvis Legs remix oh, oh, for wow. Lee Anderson. Yeah. Um, there's nine of us. I'm the I'm one of I'm the only original cast member that that took part in it. Brilliant. And so I was rehearsing during lockdown for about two weeks. Um, this one section of a um, a show that we had done 25 years we oh, created excellent. 25 years ago, and that's going to be out there because and this is the inception and the first part of a bigger thing. So in 2023, when I turn 50, I'll be doing. Um, my last professional dance performance one in london one in havana and one in new york this is what's planned stop yeah that this is what's planned. amazing um so yeah so this this is the first part next year we're going to do something else i'm building up to being a professional dancer again <laughs> as well as being a, as well as being an actor <laughs> in hollywood you know oh that's amazing well do you know what thank you so much for coming on the show it's oh, been it's an absolute, absolute pleasure. pleasure. Great talking pleasure. To you. Thank Thanks you, Thanks for Nicholas. having me on. Thank you. Bye. Bye.